Hello, hi guys. I think uh, you are able to hear now. Yeah, that's why I'm here. The session is starting today. <laughs> okay. Of course, yes. People have joined already. If you can hear and see me, you can let me know. Okay. Just hold on. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so, what I was thinking is like, uh, you know, like because we didn't do the live sessions for quite some time, and the premium sessions are also online, which we'll be uh, doing in a short while. What I was trying to uh, do is the fact that uh, we'll be doing live sessions regularly here after probably every Wednesdays, whenever I intimate, maybe after six o'clock, because six is the time when uh, where I used to complete my uh, practice on Wednesdays, especially. So Wednesday, Wednesday, we might be having some few sessions like this, maybe uh, two sessions, maybe you can keep one session from probably like two hours, maybe from seven to nine or eight to 10 like that. And after that, a second session may be from 10 to 12 or 10 30 to 12 30 like that. So I probably think of two sessions, maybe we'll be discussing something or the other, maybe even if the portions are complete, let us try discuss something or the other every time on Wednesdays, we might keep this sort of discussions probably. That's what I was thinking about. And apart from that, your uh, premium videos, we are trying to do something. So like our studio setup is ready. Even I am a little okay right now. So premium sessions might start anytime this week. Uh, with this, I think we can probably start our discussion as well. Yeah, clinical cardio in these sessions will try, you know, like in the sessions, like uh, I'm probably taking a sort of a sabbatical now. So let me try doing some uh, clinical sessions also if possible. Now there is, let us finish off uh, the mop things. Like I think only a uh, little bit of hepatology and uh, your uh, GIT is left. So like malabsorption and all this stuff. So let me finish off those things first in the first place. Okay. 
let us start the session i think uh, everything is all is audio visuals are good so i think today we'll be uh, starting with metabolic liver disease i think two things in hepatology which i have not completed is the metabolic liver disease and second is going to be the hepatocellular cancer so these are the two things and some of the liver tumors is what is uh, we didn't complete in the previous session so that is that's what we're going to do in this sessions so first let us start with metabolic liver diseases So when we are discussing about metabolic liver disease, there are three liver diseases which we need to know. So one is going to be, of course, the Wilson's disease, and second one is going to be the hemochromatosis, especially the hereditary hemochromatosis part, and the third one, of course, is going to be the alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. These are three things which we are going to discuss, by the way, in this particular uh, metabolic liver disease section. Uh, the first metabolic liver disease that is very important for exams is, of course, going to be the Wilson disease. That is the first thing we are going to discuss. Wilson disease. As far as Wilson disease is concerned, you know. Uh, the age of onset of Wilson disease. We have seen Wilson disease happening in around 20, 30, 35 years also, but nevertheless, most often the age group will be around 12 to 15 years. That is the time where the disease starts manifesting. But if you really want to know the age, we can write most commonly in the age group of probably around 12 to 20 years. That is where you uh, diagnose most of the Wilson disease cases, but it can be diagnosed even up to 35 years. And the youngest Wilson patient on record is around five, six years. So which means the age group is a little variable, but this is the most common age group where you're going to diagnose Wilson disease. And we know what is the pathophysiology behind uh, development of Wilson disease. It's going to be, it's a genetic disease, of course, and uh, it's an autosomal recessive disease. <clears throat> it's due to a problem in a gene called as ATP7B gene in chromosome number 13. So this is a chromosome that is asked multiple times in exam. I don't know why, probably they are obsessed with this chromosome, but still you can remember that I used to remember this as a unlucky disease. So, you know, and 13 is an unlucky number. So uh, 13, we can regard as an unlucky chromosome. That's why Wilson disease happens if the patient is unlucky. So that's how I used to remember. So as far as ATP7B is concerned, let us see what is the function of ATP7B. Before that, uh, we need to know the pathophysiology of development of Wilson disease, how the Wilson disease is going to be developed. As far as Wilson disease is concerned, um, it's a problem of copper. We know that, um, you know, like first when you take a dietary copper, so when copper comes in the diet, so this dietary copper is basically absorbed into the circulation by a very important transporter. You know, what is the transporter? Can anyone tell what is the transporter that is uh, responsible for absorption of dietary copper? Maybe you can result right as Cu2+. plus. No, it's not DMT1. DMT1 is also important, but uh, what I'm asking is something different. So what is the most important? I mean, DMT1 is also important, but it's DMT1 is not the only thing, but we are talking about something else here. So we are talking about something called ATP7A. This is what I want. So ATP7A is a very, very important, uh, you know, like, transporter that is important in uh, absorption of this dietary copper. So whenever there is a problem in ATP7A, so you're going to result in a disease, you know that. So that is what we refer to as a Menke's disease or Menke's kinky hair syndrome. That's what you call it as. It has a series of findings which are not going to discuss right now. So that is due to problem in ATP7A, not ATP7B. So that's why it's important because ATP7B will result in Wilson disease, but ATP7A defect will usually result in something called as Menke's disease which is due to copper deficiency because the patient cannot absorb the dietary copper. And once this copper is absorbed into the uh, circulation, it's going to enter the portal circulation, of course. So it's going to enter the portal circulation. So we can write as portal copper. So once in this portal circulation, the next destiny is going to be the liver, of course, we know that. So what happens in the liver is going to be the next part. So this is in the hepatocyte in the liver. So what happens in the liver? So whatever copper that enters uh, into the hepatocyte will be actually pushed into a protein called as aposelloplasmin. Initially, this aposelloplasmin, I mean, this, uh, this uh, protein without copper is what we refer to as aposelloplasmin. And once you load copper into the aposelloplasmin, which means usually you load up to six atoms of copper. Trust me, it is six typically six atoms of copper is what is going to get loaded into the aposelloplasmin. Once a copper is uh, loaded into the aposelloplasmin, it becomes a mature protein called as celloplasmin. 
and of course the important protein that is i mean responsible for this uh, loading of the copper into the upper celluloplasmin to become celluloplasmin is what we refer to as ATP7B so this is where it is very important so of course some of the copper will not be loaded into the upper celluloplasmin and it will be a free copper within the hepatocyte and it will be excreted in the bile of course in the bile that will be excreted as free copper and to excrete this free copper into the bile once again, you need this ATP7B. It's not like ATP7B is important only for loading the copper into the upper celluloplasmin. ATP7B is also important for loading copper into the bile as well. I mean, or pushing the copper, the redundant copper into the bile as well. Some of the copper, little copper, will go into the bile using ATP7B as well. So this celluloplasmin is the one that is considered as a transport protein for copper in the circulation. So the problem, as far as the Wilson disease is concerned, we know the problem is in the ATP7B. So ATP7B is what is going to be the problem here. So once ATP7B is mutated and uh, it is defective, you cannot load copper into the upper celluloplasmin and there will be reduced formation of celluloplasmin. So once there is reduced formation of celluloplasmin, your total copper in the blood will decrease. I mean, don't be fooled by that, but even though the free copper will increase, I'll discuss about that in some time. Uh, but at the same time, the total celluloplasmin level will be decreased. So what are the effects of ATP7B defect? Let me write it down. So ATP7B defect, number one, the first effect is going to be reduced ceruloplasmin. Of course, there is no doubt about that. Because the reduced ceruloplasmin, the total serum copper will be reduced. Because ceruloplasmin is the chief carrier of copper in the serum, in the blood. So the total serum copper will, of course, be reduced without a doubt. And second thing what's going to happen is you're going to have increased hepatocyte free copper because without ATP7B, you cannot push this copper into the bile as well. And you cannot push this copper out of the hepatocyte using celluloplasmin as well. And this upper celluloplasmin has a very short half-life and it will be destroyed within the hepatocyte. So there is a lot of accumulation of free copper within the hepatocyte. So which means I can write there is increased free copper within the hepatocyte. And this is deleterious because copper also participates in Fenton's reaction like iron and it's a very powerful oxidant as well and it's going to cause a lot of free radical damage. So I can write there will be free radical damage because of increased hepatocyte copper and that will result in the hepatocyte death. There will be hepatocyte necrosis and there will be progressive death of the hepatocytes over a period of time. And this is going to result in something called as a progressive liver damage that can progress to cirrhosis. And depending on the damage, the patients can present asymptomatic, patient can present at cirrhosis, uh, patient can present with a chronic liver disease, patient can even present uh, with acute fulminant liver failure, that is acute liver failure as well. So the damage can be to any extent. So in common, in general, the damage will be of progressive type, usually they will present with a CLD or a cirrhosis. So that's how they present. But acute liver failure, that is fulminant liver failure, is also not a very uncommon entity. There are a lot of cases in the literature and even I have seen two cases which the patients have presented with acute liver failure due to Wilson disease. So you have to take with a pinch of salt. They can present with any kind of presentation. So once the hepatocyte dies, so it doesn't only result in hepatocyte damage, that also is going to release the free copper into the circulation. It's going to release free copper into the circulation. So once this free copper gets released into the circulation, so there will be increased serum free copper. So the free copper levels will be actually increased. Remember, this is the irony here. The total serum copper will be actually reduced because celluloplasmin is the chief carrier of copper in the blood. But the free copper levels will be increased because of the release of this uh, free copper molecules without celluloplasmin from the death of the hepatocytes. So that's point number one. At the same time, this free copper, that is increased serum free copper, or free copper in the circulation in excess is definitely going to cause copper deposition in other tissues as well. Celluloplasmin is the one that protects the deposition of copper into other organs. It is a transport protein which helps in just delivery of copper to particular areas where they need copper, but free copper is no good and it's going to definitely result in deposition of copper in other tissues. This copper deposition will result in free radical damage again. So which means, for example, they can uh, have organ deposition and this free copper can also result in something called as hemolysis. 
hemolysis as well. So sometimes they can result in development of hemolysis, especially hemolysis is very common in patients who are present with acute liver failure. But apart from that, hemolysis is uncommon in patients who are coming with cirrhosis or probably a chronic liver. But in patients who are present with acute liver failure, hemolysis is one of the very, very important clues. One of the clues for diagnosing Wilson disease that is causing acute liver failure. And uh, copper that is deposited in the organs, for example, in the eyes, it can deposit, especially in the cornea that results in development of this caser flusher rings. Or in the CNS, central nervous system, it can deposit, especially in the basal ganglia. It can start depositing and it can produce neurodegeneration and chorea there and the movement disorders because uh, that, I mean, they produce that characteristic wing beating tremors. So it's a neurodegenerative disorder as well. So these are the effects that are going to happen due to uh, increased copper deposition in different organs. And in all these areas, they are going to participate in fenton reaction and they're going to result in development of free radical media damage. So this is the wholesome pathophysiology of development of Wilson disease. Remember, once the serum copper, if in, I mean, if the free serum copper is increased, even the urinary free copper will increase as well. The free urinary copper levels also will increase, which means the urinary copper or the total urinary copper also will increase because celluloplasma is not something that, that's going to get excreted in the urine. Uh, so in these patients with Wilson disease, the urinary copper will be high. That is because the free serum copper is very high, which will be filtered by the kidneys and uh, excreted in the urine. So which is a very important uh, diagnostic point. At the same time, when you come to the clinical features of Wilson disease, you can divide the clinical features into three presentations. So one is going to be the hepatic presentation. And second one is going to be the neurologic presentation. And third one is going to be, of course, the psychiatric presentation. So next thing is the first one is the hepatic presentation. Remember, it is highly variable, which I've told you. They can have an asymptomatic spectrum, which means incidentally you will find because of uh, some altered LFTs, very rare, but still possible. Or they can present with chronic liver disease, or they can present with cirrhosis, completed cirrhosis as well, or they can present with uh, acute fulminant liver failure, that is ALF as well, acute liver failure. Or they can present with simple acute hepatitis without ALF as well acute hepatitis without ALF as well. But if you ask the common presentations, it's going to be CLD or cirrhosis. This is how they're going to present from the hepatic standpoint. ALF is rare, asymptomatic and acute hepatitis presentation is also quite rare. Not that common compared to the of CLD and cirrhosis presentation. And uh, what they will be definitely asking you is what are the characteristic features of ALF due to Wilson disease? So what will be the characteristic features of acute liver failure due to Wilson. There is some characteristic markers in the form of enzymes or probably the ratios that we're going to see. Number one, if at all the ALF is happening due to Wilson disease, clearly you'll be having hemolytic anemia. And if I ask you whether it's a Coombs positive or Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, you're definitely going to answer it is a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia because it's not an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That is because of high copper that is released into circulation that is actually causing free radical damage and hemolysis. So it will be Coombs negative. It's not autoimmune etiology. That's what the answer is. And typically the hemolytic anemia will be intravascular hemolysis, more of a intravascular hemolysis and not extravascular hemolysis. Clear? And because copper damages the red cell membrane heavily and it causes oxidative damage to the red cell membrane, that is the reason why uh, hemolysis happens in this particular setting. And usually, uh, whenever there is hepatitis and liver failure, there will be elevated alkaline, I mean, uh, AST and ALT. The liver enzymes will be elevated. But remember, I think I've told you this point already, in ALF due to Wilson disease, AST levels will be more than ALT levels in the sense like AST, LT ratio will be, uh, I mean, LT, AST ratio will be less than one, or uh, we can call it as OTPT ratio. So because here the patient is having a, a OT, which is more than PT, OTPT ratio will be more than one. So very few conditions, you'll have OTPT ratio of more than one. One example is alcohol, which I've discussed already. Alcoholic hepatitis, you'll have a OTPT ratio of usually more than or equal to one. That's called a DRTS ratio, which I've discussed already. A second example is in Wilson disease, where even in Wilson disease, the patients might have AST more than ALT. And number three, uh, you might be having very, very low alkaline phosphatase. This is something which I've described already in the earlier section. So very low alkaline phosphatase is a characteristic feature of Wilson disease, which means uh, less than 40. And there is one ratio called as uh, ALP to total bilirubin ratio. Because the ALP levels will be very low in uh, acute liver failure due to Wilson disease and total bilirubin levels may be very high, this ratio is usually less than 4. So this is something that can be asked in exam. If, the, if at all the patient is suffering from ALF due to Wilson disease, very likely your ALP by total bilirubin ratio will be less than 4, which means ALP levels will be very low and bilirubin levels will be very high. So that is the reason why uh, your uh, ratio will be less than four. And that is the reason. And fourth, not very important, but they might be having very low 
serum uric acid levels. The reason for this is unknown, but they might have a very low serum uric acid. So these are the characteristic features of ALF due to Wilson disease. In that, I believe that this point, this point and uh, this point is going to be the most important. If at all the most important point, I will go for the hemolytic anemia due to acute, I mean, due to Wilson disease, and that's going to be the most important exam question as well. And apart from that, if you go to the neurological picture, because most of the copper deposition happens in the basal ganglia and probably somewhere in the cerebellum, uh, you're going to have a lot of extra abdominal and cerebellar features. So which means the most important typical features will be extra abdominal features. As far as extra abdominal features is concerned, the most common is going to be the dystonias as, as opposed to the tremors that are very commonly studied in undergraduation. Dystonia is going to be the most common picture. Then you might get ataxia, then you can get tremors. Usually tremors will be uh, mild tremors only, but sometimes you can get this kind of uh, flinging tremors like we call it as wing beating tremors. That's also possible in Wilson. Even though wing beating tremors is a classical word that is correlated with Wilson disease, but most of the times you don't really get that kind of like uh, very explosive tremors. It will be very mild tremors only in patients with Wilson disease. And they can develop bradykinesia and Parkinsonism because of the deposition of the basal ganglia, of course. And they can develop this drooling of saliva as well drooling of saliva as well. The most important point is the fact that uh, there won't be any sensory changes and there will be absolutely only motor problems. Bladder bowel incontinence will not be there and there won't be any associated sensory problems as well. And uh, if you take a CT or MRI, you can see hyperintensity in the basal ganglia region. Basal ganglia. Remember in MRI, if you ask which kind of MRI, it's T1 or T2 weighted and T2 weighted MRI, of course. In T2 weighted MRI, you might see a Hyperintensive in the basal ganglia, and at the same time in CT imaging also you might see happens in the basal ganglia. But apart from that, there is not much you're going to see in CT or MRI. Coming to the psychiatric problems, because many of them are school-going children, like uh, 10 years, 12 years, so that is the time where you're going to diagnose Wilson disease. The first thing you will usually notice poor performance in the schools or probably in the colleges if they are joined early. So in that setting, you might be having that low performance state. And uh, some children and adolescent people can go for depression irritability, and they might get, develop a label mood. They can develop frank psychosis as well. At the same time, they'll be having dysthymia, and uh, even the psychosis can be of bipolar depressive psychosis as well. It could be any form of psychosis. But nevertheless, declined school performance is uh, one of the classic features of Wilson disease, and it can be picked up at early stages if you are uh, knowing this differential diagnosis, which is also very important. And apart from that, you have some extra presentations as well, extra features of Wilson disease. For example, you have the classic KF ring, so which uh, which is an ocular deposition of copper. Especially, you know, it's got the copper is having affinity towards the decimates membrane in the cornea. So Wilson disease uh, can have this, uh, patients with Wilson disease can have this KF rings. So, you know, it's a brownish ring due to deposition of copper in the decimates membrane in the cornea. And remember KF ring, the amount, I mean, the intensity of the KF ring usually is proportional to the CNS copper. That's very, very important. It's not the hepatic copper that, that's, uh, that's going to be demonstrated in the KF ring. It's the CNS copper. Amount of CNS copper is going to be directly reflected in the KF ring. So that's why they call eyes are the window to your brain. So like that, if you see the intensity of the KF ring, the more the intensity of the KF ring is, more is going to be the CNS copper. Remember, literally all patients with CNS disease will have KF rings for sure, which means indirectly you can tell if the patient is having a KF ring, you can tell surely they will be having CNS disease. The association between KF ring and CNS disease is approximately 98%. Practically speaking, it's 100%, but theoretically speaking, it's 98%, which means each and every individual you see with Wilson disease, if they have a KF ring, of course, they will definitely have a CNS disease as well. So typically KF ring is best seen in the slit lamp examination. Uh, you should not see with the naked eyes. Naked eyes, you might see, but slit lamp is one of the best uh, ways to see this KF ring. At the same time, it disappears with treatment as well. So this is something I've been telling in the previous lectures as well, even in my some of my unacademy lectures as well. And that's the same question that's asked in the recent times as well. It disappears with treatment. Once you start treatment, this KF ring will disappear. So in the sense, like uh, it can be used as, uh, you know, like uh, an entity for following up your following up a patient whether they respond to treatment or not. So it disappears with treatment over a period of time. But it takes a nice three to five, five years to disappear. It's not something that's going to disappear in a day or two or a month or two. It's going to take around three to five years to disappear. And second ocular thing is the fact that they can develop cataract. 
and you know what is the type of cataract that you're going to get in Wilson disease patient that is going to be uh, sunflower type of cataract. So let me show you an image. By the way, yeah. This is the image I wanted to show you. Yeah, got it. This is the image I want to show. So this is the example of KF rings. You can see a brownish ring that uh, you're seeing here. So this is the KF ring basically, which is shown by the red arrow here. And of course, uh, this is the typical sunflower cataract that you're seeing here. And this is the KF ring that is seen in the slit lamp examination as well. Maybe I can show here. This is the KF ring that is seen in slit lamp examination. Clear? And this is the typical sunflower cataract. And this is the KF ring that is seen in the naked eye. So this is a very important image as well. So there might be some few images that might be asked. And one more finding that you can see in the nails that you want to show. So this kind of uh, bluish discoloration of Nails is a very important finding in Wilson disease as well. This is what we refer to as something called as azure lunule. A Z U R E. That's called azure lunule. Clear? Uh, usually, again, this kind of bluish discoloration also disappears with treatment. In the sense, this can also be used as a marker for follow-up of their treatment and therapy. And apart from that, ocular presentations they can have renal presentations as well, which are quite rare. Uh, as I told you. Uh, any in, inborn errors of metabolism, I think we have discussed that in nephrology as well, can produce renal tubular acidosis, especially proximal RTA compared to the distal RTA. We have discussed this already. I've told you fancy conditions uh, uh, in proximal RTA produces Fanconi. We have discussed that already in nephrology section. Fancy means Fanconi in the sense like uh, fancy conditions like inborn errors of metabolism, cystinuria, wills, and all these are fancy conditions so they can produce Fanconi and hence proximal renal tubular acidosis. And they can develop cardiomyopathy. Typically, any metabolic condition will produce restrictive or dilated. Very commonly, they'll produce restricted type of cardiomyopathy only. And patients with Wilson disease can experience infertility as well. So these are the usual key points that is important for exams. Then uh, let us move on to the investigation. How to diagnose a Wilson disease, investigation-wise. As far as Wilson disease investigation is concerned, the most useless investigation is the serum copper. Uh, the free copper or total copper, whatever you do. So that is going to be the most useless investigation, which is never performed at all in the first place. The usual screening test that you're going to do is serum celluloplasmin. This is the first test or probably we can call it as a screening test uh, of choice for Wilson disease patients. Usually the serum celluloplasmin levels will be decreased. If you ask somebody ask what is the normal levels, normally it is more than 20 milligrams per deciliter or 20 milligrams percentage, this is normal. If it's less than 20, probably you can think about Wilson disease in that perspective. But this is not a very good investigation, even though it's a screening test. The reason is because it can be normal in approximately. People with Wilson disease can be having a normal celluloplasmin in approximately 10 to 25 percentage. In the sense like 10 to 25 percentage of patients with Wilson disease can have a normal serum cop, I mean serum celluloplasmin, which is, that is the reason why it is not always reliable. Suppose the levels are less than four, it confirms that the patient is having Wilson disease for sure. Levels of less than four will confirm for sure 100% the patient is having Wilson disease. Remember, it can be normal in 10 to 25 percentage, but if the levels are less than four, there is no doubt 100%. With that itself, you can make a diagnosis that the patient is having Wilson disease for sure. This is the utility of celluloplasmin. Remember, celluloplasmin is most often used as a screen test, which means this is one of the first tests that is done in patients who are, who are suspected to have Wilson disease. And second important investigation is the slit lamp examination because if you are able to find out the KF ring, then probably the patient might be suffering from Wilson disease. Remember, KF ring is not very, very specific for Wilson disease. In the sense like almost, you know, like if you see a KF ring with appropriate clinical features, it is equal to Wilson disease only. But KF ring is not 100% specific in the sense it can be seen in Wilson disease. At the same time, it can be seen in certain cholestatic conditions as well. Like any cholestatic condition, even extrahepatic or intrahepatic cholestatic, like primary bilay cirrhosis, can develop KF ring over a period of time. The reason for that is very, very simple. You come back, comes come back to the pathophysiology. Remember, uh, you know there is some amount of copper that is getting extracted in the bile. 
So if there is a cholestasis, the bile cannot flow properly in the sense like this copper that is getting excreted into the bile cannot get excreted properly. So there will be increased accumulation of copper within the hepatocyte. And by the same mechanism, they're going to release that excess copper. And by the same mechanism, they can produce increased uh, uh, free copper in the serum, which can cause deposition in the cornea and they can produce KF ring over a period of time. So one of the important differential diagnoses for KF ring, uh, apart from Wilson disease, you need to know is the cholestatic disorders, which can produce KF rings as well. And apart from that, uh, we do something called 24-hour urinary copper. 24-hour urinary copper. Of course, as I told you in patients with Wilson disease, the free copper levels in the serum are high. So 24-hour urinary copper levels will be increased in patients with Wilson disease. Usually, if the levels are more than 100 microgram per day, in the sense like uh, 24-hour urinary copper is more than 100 micrograms, this is considered to be diagnostic of Wilson disease, by the way. So number four is liver biopsy. Liver biopsy is considered to be the gold standard for uh, Wilson disease, even though it has a lot of pitfalls, but liver biopsy is considered to be gold standard. Remember the copper uh, or the, the amount of copper per gram of dry weight of liver is going to be high in patients with Wilson disease in the sense like typical ranges, the typical values will be more than 250 microgram per gram of dry weight of liver. So this is after biopsy is what I'm telling. After biopsy, if you take the weight of the liver, that's called a dry weight once you fix and do. So if it's more than 250 microgram per gram of dry weight of liver, that's considered to be one of the gold standard findings of Wilson disease. But normal copper will be less than 35 microgram per gram of dry weight. That's the normal amount of copper in the liver. But if it's exceeding 250, then you can be almost sure that the patient is suffering from Wilson disease. But please understand, Increased hepatic copper may not only happen in patients with Wilson disease, as I told you, in patients who are having cholestatic conditions also may have an increased hepatic copper. Uh, so that is why you need to be a little careful. So for KF ring as well as liver biopsy increased copper, one of the important differential diagnoses is cholestatic condition. So it's not absolutely specific, but still, uh, when you consider appropriate clinical presentation and you do investigations, increased copper is considered to be very, very uh, specific for Wilson disease diagnosis. But if you do an appropriate clinical setting, if you just ask whether it is specific or not, actually answer is not 100%. But when you do an appropriate clinical setting, the child is coming with neuropsychiatric manifestations and the child is coming with uh, uh, hepatitis, then in that setting, if you see increased copper, of course, I'll be diagnosing Wilson disease only. And uh, next is the genetic testing, which also has a role to some extent. Here we are going to find out the ATP 7B mutations in chromosome number 13. Uh, so, which is almost considered to be the best way of diagnosing Wilson disease. Remember, but this is a little tough. This ATP7B gene defect testing is not available in all the centers. So, you can, I mean, you can use this genetic testing if at all, if your uh, liver biopsy is not conclusive, plus there is a strong suspicion of Wilson disease. If your liver biopsy is not suggestive of uh, Wilson, in the sense like it's having a very confusing picture. Less than 35 is normal, more than 250 is definitely diagnostic of Wilson, but if it's in the range of 50 to 250, plus if you have a strong suspicion of Wilson disease, then in that setting, you can go for uh, ATP 7B gene testing. Otherwise, it's generally not recommended. Most of the times you can diagnose based on clinical criteria and uh, clinical and I mean uh, features and as well as the other investigations. And serum copper, as I told you, is one of the most useless investigations. Never ever do the serum copper in reality. So where we know that free copper will be definitely increased, but total copper in the serum will be definitely decreased because of poor availability of celluloplasmin. Clear? But this is very, very unreliable investigation. It's considered as the most unreliable investigation. So don't do this in the first place. And how to evaluate as an algorithmic basis. Uh, in a patient who is suspected to have Wilson disease. First thing what you're going to do is serum celluloplasmin. Any patient who is suspected to have Wilson disease, you do serum celluloplasmin and slit lamp examination by an ophthalmologist. Plus you are also going to do a 24-hour urinary copper. All these things to be done at once, usually. First, I'm going to see the celluloplasmin value. Based on that, I'm going to segregate all these things. So first see the celluloplasmin. Uh, if the celluloplasmin levels are low, there is a strong suspicion of Wilson. Celluloplasmin levels are may not high really. So normal values are more than 20. So I can call it as normal. Less than 20 means I can call it as low. So next step is to look for the KF ring, whether the KF ring is there or not. So the KF ring is present or KF ring is absent. 
uh, whatever, no matter what next step is to look for the urinary copper. So if the urinary copper is going to be high, that is more than 100. So this makes a diagnosis, which means if the celloplasm is low, KF ring is positive, urinary copper is increased. So what else you need to make? An, I mean, not, I mean to rule out Wilson disease, it's definitely Wilson disease for sure. The urinary copper is low. So this is a confusing situation, which means you don't really see a KF ring, but celloplasmin levels are low. Uh, but at the same time, urinary copper levels are also not up to the mark. So in this setting, uh, only because of low celloplasmin and you have some uh, clinical features that are suggest of Wilson, in that setting, best is to go for liver biopsy. If the liver biopsy is also not suggestive, in the sense like if it's in the range of 50 to 120, I mean 250 microgram per gram, then you can probably go for genetic testing. Otherwise, it's not required. So if liver biopsy is suggestive, then you can finish it off. That's enough. So liver biopsy is also not suggestive and very confusing, but clinical features are very clear and correlating with Wilson disease, then you can go for genetic testing. So if the serum celloplasmin is normal, then of course I'm going to see the KF ring. So if the KF ring is present, then uh, remember if the, here the celloplasmin is normal, but there is a KF ring. So in this setting, it's better to go for liver biopsy or genetic testing. So remember genetic testing is done only if the liver biopsy is also indeterminate, but liver biopsy will give you the answer most of the times because this is also another confused situation where celloplasmin is normal and uh, KF ring is present. So this is little contradictory. The KF ring is absent in the first place. Then final take home point is because we have done all these three things together. Then you have to look at the urinary copper reports. If the urinary copper is high, then I'll be going for genetic testing versus liver biopsy. This is what I'll be doing if the urinary copper levels are high because it's another confusing situation. If the urinary copper levels are low, diagnosis excluded, which means that the patient is not suffering from Wilson disease, which means the patient is having normal celloplasmin, no KF ring, low urinary copper, less than 100. So you can clearly exclude the diagnosis in this particular setting. So which means the only way where you can truly make a diagnosis, low celloplasmin, positive KF ring and high urinary copper. If there is or if can truly exclude the diagnosis when the patient is having a normal celloplasmin, no KF ring and low urinary copper, because these three investigations will be usually done in tandem, not like uh, as a step-by-step -step basis. So when all three are negative, then you can exclude and all three are positive, you can make a diagnosis there itself. Any indeterminate findings like one is positive, other is negative, then in that setting, you can either go for a liver biopsy versus a genetic testing. This is the final take-home point. So this is the, I mean, uh, final take home message from this particular algorithm, which I have told you. So then we have some diagnostic criteria as well. So the names is what they will be asking you. There is something called Leipzig meeting criteria. So in the Leipzig meeting, they made a diagnostic criteria, which happened in 2001. Basically, it's a very old one. I remember Leipzig meeting also proposed a diagnostic criteria for Menkes disease as well. The Leipzig meeting did not only propose a diagnostic criteria for uh, uh, you know, like Wilson disease, they also have proposed a diagnostic criteria for Menkes disease as well. Based on the Leipzig meeting criteria, you have some parameters. If the score is more than or equal to four, then your diagnosis of Wilson disease is supposed to be likely. And if the score is three, then it is probable diagnosis, not, you know, you need to do other investigations. If it is less than or equal to two, then Wilson disease is considered to be unlikely. So according to this meeting criteria, if the score is more than four, then you can probably think about Wilson disease. Otherwise, it is excluded, basically. And for prognostication, you have a score as well. So that is what we refer to as a Nazar index or Nazar score. This is for prognostication, basically. Uh, you have three, I mean, three things, basically, uh, as far as the uh, Nazar score is concerned. So generally, uh, I, you know, like uh, tend to call it as ATP, ATP score. So why I generally called, I mean, why I keep a mnemonic of ATP is because Wilson disease is due to deficiency of ATP7B or due to defect of ATP7B. So if I put the same mnemonic, it will be easier for you to understand. That's why. So A stands for AST, T stands for total bilirubin, and P stands for prothrombin time. So this will be a very easy mnemonic for you because this is something that is attached to a Wilson disease itself. So AST, total bilirubin, and prothrombin time. So these are the three variables that you have to know uh, to calculate NASA score. So for NASR score, the total score will be of, I mean, ranging from zero to 12 in the first place. So if the score is in the range of uh, zero to six first, uh, this is considered to be a low risk patient and the prognosis is generally going to be good. 
and because of that we can manage these patients just medically itself you don't need any liver transplantation so if it is 7 to 9 these patients are judged clinically uh, these are in, indeterminate patients intermediate prognostic patients so either you can go for medical management or you can go for a liver transplantation it's like a child book score only if you come back to that so if the score is uh, 10 to 12 or more than equal to 10 so these patients are going to have a very poor prognosis so it's better that these patients are going to go for liver transplantation so the best candidates for liver transplantation is a score of 10 to 12 high risk patients so intermediate group patients either medical or transplant and it has to be judged clinically low risk patients so those are having good prognosis you can straight away start with medical treatment that alone is going to be more than enough and now i'm going to put another slide and you're going to tell what is the stain that is used here so i'm going to tell that this patient is basically suffering from wilson disease okay let me show you this so this is a patient who's suffering from wilson disease and this is the hepatic copper that's shown with the arrows that red color things what you have see what you see here is the hepatic copper that we are seeing here so what is the stain that is used so staining copper here any idea What is the stain that is used? Okay, not alizarin. That's not a common stain used in reality. Stain that is used here is rhodamine. One of the important copper stains, I mean, that is used in, in my hospital as well. So this is a rhodamine stain that for staining copper. So, and it stains this kind of uh, reddish pink color. So that's how the copper is stained. And you can even quantify copper because of, I mean, based on certain pathological algorithms are there. So rhodamine is the stain that is used here that is showing accumulation of copper within the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes. And let us come back to the treatment. I mean, usually whenever I discuss about the treatment, I discuss on the ASLD guidelines. So that is American Association, I mean, American Society of Liver Disease. So ASLD is the one that is, uh, I mean, there are many societies, as I told you, you have ASLD, you have APASL, you have uh, then ESL is there. So many societies are there based on which population they encounter. So in India, we have a APASL guideline. So that is the uh, Asia Pacific class, I mean, Society of Liver Disease. Similarly, you have American Society also, that is ASLD. Then we have ESL also. But Harrison, most of the time, any standard textbooks will give the ASLD guidelines only. But nevertheless, the treatment is going to be the same. The crux is going to be the same. There will be small, small changes here and there, depending on which population they encounter. But nevertheless, so we are going to treat. So you can divide into two groups of population. One is going to be asymptomatic group and second is going to be the symptomatic group. As far as asymptomatic group is concerned, we can split into two. Initial uh, management and the maintenance therapy. Maintenance therapy. So maintenance therapy, whatever may be the fact, whether it is a symptomatic patient or asymptomatic patient, doesn't matter. The maintenance therapy is going to be the same. Clear? Okay. The maintenance therapy is going to be the same. That is going to be either zinc or probably a low-dose chelating agent. Low-dose chelation. That's going to be the maintenance therapy. Remember, zinc is best known for maintenance therapy. But zinc as a sole therapy is absolute nonsense. We are not going to use zinc as a sole therapy because many times they have, I mean, I don't know where it's been mentioned, but uh, some students have asked me the question that zinc is the treatment of choice for Wilson disease. Actually, no. Uh, if you know the mechanism action of zinc and how it works, you'll be knowing that. So chelating agents are the ones that are going to remove the copper that is deposited in the organs. Zinc is just going to prevent or reduce the dietary absorption of copper. In a sense, we know that copper's main source is going to be the dietary copper. So this copper is actually coming from the intestine only. So which means to dietary absorption of copper. Zinc actually prevents the uh, dietary absorption of copper. In the sense like uh, zinc is also Zutton 2 plus and copper is also Cu2 plus. And because both are divalent and they compete with each other. So when you give excess zinc, the amount of copper absorption will be actually quite less. So that is the basic idea, which means the main uh, mechanism action of zinc is to reduce the dietary absorption of copper. So what about the copper that is already deposited in the organs and that's going to cause damage, like neurological damage or liver damage? That cannot be removed by zinc. So in the sense, like a patient who's having symptoms or any patient for that matters, I generally don't like uh, 
giving zinc alone as a standalone therapy because the copper that is already deposited has to be removed and that can be done only by proper chelative therapy. So remember, if the patient is asymptomatic, uh, then you have options in this particular setting. So which means if patient is coming incidental presentation or probably the patient is not having any symptoms at all, then in this setting, you can try two things. So first line, maybe probably I can think about uh, chelative therapy. And again, that's going to be the first line therapy. Uh, I'll tell you what are the chelative uh, drugs that we have. Suppose if the patient is not tolerating or developing significant side effects due to chelative therapy, then second line option is going to be zinc. Zinc is a second line option, but still the first line option is going to be chelation. So you have to remove the copper that is deposited already. So for that, you need chelation for sure. Pain is symptomatic, then there is no doubt about that. There's only one therapy that you should give, whether they are tolerant or not, doesn't matter. You need to give only chelation therapy because the patient is already symptomatic and you have to remove the copper that is deposited in the organs already. So zinc is never a drug of choice, they don't know. And the fact like, you know, like uh, even in pregnancy, you can give chelation. It's not like uh, you should not give uh, chelation in pregnancy. I don't know because some students do ask zinc is the treatment of choice in pregnancy. No, it's not like that. Zinc is safe in pregnancy. It's not that uh, chelating agents are not safe in pregnancy. Even chelating agents are considered to be safe in patients with pregnancy. So what are the chelating options that we have? We have two drugs that we commonly use. One is going to be D-penicillamine and second is going to be the trientine. So these are the two drugs that are available for chelation. In that whatever is ideal you can use, but uh, there is a little bit better and uh, safe pharmacokinetics compared, I mean, of trientin compared to the of d So if you want to choose one drug, probably I would be preferring trientin. Uh, but I mean, both uh, compared to the efficacy wise, both are going to be, of course, the same. Clear? So trientin may edge ahead a little bit. That is because it has a better side effect profile and a little bit better pharmacokinetics and better safety profile compared to d -pencilamine. But apart from that, efficacy wise, both are almost going to be the same. So if you want to choose one drug among the two, I'll go for Triant. But both are efficacy wise the same, which I've told you already. And uh, whether they can be given in uh, pregnancy or not. Yes, chelative therapy can be given in pregnancy, but please understand only the dose should be reduced by 30 to 50 percentage, whatever pre-pregnant doses that you are giving, you have to reduce the dosage by 30 to 50 percentage. There are some animal models which tell some teratogenic effects, but uh, overall, in general, the guidelines say it is considered to be safe in pregnancy because uh, the copper load in pregnancy is considered to be more dangerous compared to that of the uh, teratogenic effects caused by these drugs. So definitely, you know, like you can give chelating agents if the patient is symptomatic even during pregnancy, but just the fact that the dose should be reduced by 30 to 50 percent in this particular setting. Okay, so now we discussed all these things. Remember, there is no standard drug of choice for Wilson disease. It's all about rational drug, which I've told you already multiple times. So don't tell any drug of choice, zinc or trientin or deep insulin. I mean, there are certain diseases where you cannot tell drug of choice. Uh, Wilson disease is such a, uh, you know, like disease. So you, are, you have to use therapies in combination or in tandem with each other. This is the therapy for Wilson disease. And you have certain targets, which you have not discussed. So what are the targets for treatment of this chelating agents? Remember, uh, you should have increased urinary copper in the sense like these chelating agents are going to basically remove the copper that is deposited in the organs and they're going to excrete them in the urine. So in the sense like the urinary copper target is going to be somewhere around 200 to 500 microgram per day. This is initially. During initial chelation, you need to uh, give the dose to achieve this amount of copper in the urine, 200 to 500 microgram per day. So urinary copper... Uh, usually will, I mean, even though we set a range of 200 to 500, uh, it might reach a value of more than 500 usually. But remember, uh, by around 6 to 12 months, 6 to 12 months of time, it becomes less than 200 microgram per day, which means initially it will be in the range of 200 to 500 or maybe more than two, more than 500 also sometimes if the copper amount, I mean, deposit in the body is too much. Then after 6 to 12 months, the amount of copper that is going to be excreted in the urine will come to less than 200 microgram per day. In the sense like your chelation is, oh, I mean, is has done a good job and has removed almost all the copper from the body. That's what it means. And uh, second target. So this is the target number one, the urinary copper. Within 6 to 12 months, you have to achieve that less than 200 microgram per day range. And uh, non-celloplasmin bound copper. Non-celloplasmin bound serum copper in the sense like we're talking about a free serum copper that should be less than 15 micrograms per deciliter this is the second target even though for diagnosis serum copper is not useful maybe for establishing therapy it might be useful 
And third is the normalization of LFT. Usually this will be achieved in three to six months time once again. So usually these are the targets that you need to achieve before stopping the chelation. But in general, the duration of chelation will be typically usually six months to five years. After which you will put the patients on maintenance therapy in the sense like either maintenance therapy can be zinc or maybe a low dose chelation. So these are things you are going to follow either zinc or probably a low dose chelation. Both can be choices. Just hold on. Okay, all right. So these are the important things that you need to know about Wilson disease. Remember, initially the urinary copper excretion will be very high because they drain the body out of copper and excrete in the urine, the chelating agents. And over a period of time, it will become less than 200 and that's going to be the ultimate target. And uh, the total, uh, I mean, the non celluloplasmin bound copper, that is a free copper should be less than 15 micrograms per deciliter and the patient should have a normal LFT. Usually the targets will be achieved in a period of six months to five years and that's going to be the total duration of chelation. Once you have achieved all these targets, then probably you can put the patient on maintenance therapy, which is going to be either zinc or going to be a uh, low dose curative therapy. So this completes the discussion on Wilson disease. So if you have any doubts on Wilson disease, you can ask, or if you don't have any doubts, we can move proceed further to hemochromatosis. Clear? Do you understand Wilson disease, by the way? So whatever we discussed. Okay, so what we have discussed is first is going to be the epidemiology, then chromosome pathophysiology, then we have discussed on the clinical features, the hepatic, neurologic, psychiatric and uh, ocular presentations, including renal presentations and cardiac presentations we have discussed. Then we have discussed on the diagnostic standpoints, what is the algorithm for diagnosis of Wilson disease. Then we have discussed on the treatment part, prognostic index and diagnostic scoring. And uh, of course, we have discussed on the treatment part as well, when to use chelation, when not to use chelation. And uh, what is the best therapy? Of course, it's chelation. Zinc is not at all a best therapy, to be honest. And of course, next thing, what you need to know is when, what are the targets to be achieved and when to put the patients on maintenance therapy once you have achieved the target. Okay. Next is the hemochromatosis. This is the next disorder that we're going to discuss, hemochromatosis. I mean, there are many forms of hemochromatosis. We know that. So one is going to be the primary hemochromatosis, or we can call it as hereditary hemochromatosis. And second is going to be the secondary hemochromatosis. Secondary hemochromatosis is due to secondary iron overload in the sense usual cause will be multiple transfusions. So transfusional iron overload. Second is going to be ineffective erythropoiesis. The best examples where repeated transfusions will cause iron overload is going to happen in the setting of probably hemoglobinopathies, like prob probably thalassemia. So that's where it's going to happen, point number one. Or probably in patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. This is another situation where you're going to have multiple transfusions, repeated transfusions again and again. So whenever you do repeated transfusions, you might develop with a secondary iron overload and hemochromatosis. I mean, secondary hemochromatosis. And uh, next thing what you need to know is uh, ineffective erythropoiesis, as I told you. Ineffective erythropoiesis. We have discussed this in premium lectures, I guess. In the hematology section, we have discussed this already. In thalassemia, the reason for iron overload is two things. One is due to transfusion, and second is due to ineffective erythropoiesis itself. So ineffective erythropoiesis, the best examples will be thalassemia. Probably you can think about sickle cell disease or probably some conditions like sideroblastic anemia where you can have ineffective erythropoiesis. Because of that, you might have an iron overload. And third is excessive alcohol consumption, which can produce secondary iron overload because alcohol is known to increase iron absorption. At the same time, alcohol can also produce sideroblastic anemia because alcohol can uh, derange the paradoxin metabolism and so on. So, so because of that, you can result in sideroblastic anemia and secondary iron overload and alcohol directly can increase the absorption of iron and that can also cause iron overload over a period of time. And any patients with chronic liver disease may have an iron overload because uh, liver is the one that handles iron efficiently. If the liver cannot handle iron efficiently, so there will be a lot of free iron which can result in depression of iron in other areas and they can result in problems, chronic liver disease. And next is porphyrias. 
we know power failures all power failures will result in increased hepatic iron overload that's why power failures have a risk of developing hepatocellular cancer as well the reason why power failures cause we have discussed multiple times in the past so you know that uh, for producing hemoglobin you need heme at the same time you need iron as well to produce hemoglobin suppose if you cannot produce heme so that's what is happening in porphyrias you will not be able to produce sufficient amount of heme which means the iron is something that cannot be utilized here sorry here it is globin isn't it globin so heme is basically going to come from uh, two things one is going to be the iron and uh, second is going to be the porphyrin ring both are going to produce heme so in porphyrias you cannot produce the porphyrin ring uh which means the iron will be underutilized here so there will be excessive spillage of iron because you cannot produce sufficient porphyrin rings to produce heme so that is the reason why uh this iron might get uh, deposited in the organs resulting in iron overload so that is the an another reason why you get get second iron overload so one of the important reasons porphyria we remember porphyria is also carries an increased risk of developing hepatocellular cancer for any porphyria for that matter has increased risk of developing hepatocellular cancer and what about hereditary hemochromatosis there are many different types of hereditary hemochromatosis in that very i mean only one thing i'm going to discuss but nevertheless you have many different types you have type 1 you have type 2a then you have type 2b then you have type 3 then you have type 4 basically you have four types in that type 2 has 2a and 2b almost all are inherited as autosomal recessive inheritance except one which is the last type that is autosomal dominant if you ask the gene that is defective is the most common gene that is defective in hereditary hemochromatosis that is hfe gene and second one is hjv that is hemojuvenile gene and third one is hamp this is the one that produces hepsirin hamp is the one that produces hepsirin molecule so that can be defective and next tf or transferrin receptor can be defective or next one there is something called slc 40a1 so this also can be defective this is a protein that can be defective so what is a pro i mean protein that is coded by hfe hfe codes for hfe protein this is the gene we are talking about this is the protein we are talking about hfe codes for hfe protein and hjv uh, codes for hjv hemojuvenile protein and uh, hamp codes as i told you already it codes for hepsirin protein and transferrin receptor codes i mean tfr codes for transferrin receptor type 2 uh, protein and uh, ac slc 40a1 codes for ferroportin so i mean we have discussed all this about uh, what is ferroportin and what is hfe what is hepsirin what is transferrin receptor all these things have been discussed already but just i'm telling the fact so the rarest form is this fourth form only which is the rarest form and the most common form is going to be the hfe gene mutations and uh, hfe gene mutations has two types so one is this classic c282y which is the most common 85% and less common is h63d mutations 15% which is much much less common remember uh, type 1 typically presents in adults type 2a presents in children because you can remember the name hemojuvenilin so it presents typically in children and type 2b you can remember two presents in children so two also i mean this also is going to present in children only and uh, type 3 will present in young adults and type 4 come back to adults so type 1 is the most common that typically presents in adults you can remember type 2 is the only thing that presents typically in children uh, hemojuvenilin related mutations and uh, there are some um, variation in the distribution of copper as well for example if you take the first three types 1 2 and 3 the copper will be typically present in i mean typically seen in the periportal region periportal region of the hepatocytes or probably in the central lobular distribution so periportal is uh, location is the place where you see maximum amount of copper that is i mean sorry not copper iron because we are discussing about hemochromatosis maximum amount of iron is typically seen in the periportal region in types 1 to 3 but when you go for the type 4 the copper is typically not seen in the parenchyma of the liver instead it will be seen more in the copper cells of course you know like because this is a ferroportin defect so because it's a ferroportin defect the ferroportin is very very important for transport of copper in the reticular endothelial system that is the reason why one of the important uh, uh reticular endothelial system cell within the liver is uh, copper cell and that is the reason why in ferroportin defects that is scl40 slc40 a1 defects uh the iron is predominantly seen in the copper cells so in the first three types 1 2 and 3 iron will be typically seen in the liver parenchyma especially in the periportal region then followed by the central lobular region so 1 2 and 3 periportal region and in type 4 it is the copper cells which is going to have the maximum amount of iron 
so which is very important and also one of the important significant features of type 4 is the fact that it is the only type of hemochromatosis hereditary form of hemochromatosis that's going to be autosomal dominant inheritance and of course iron you know the problem is the fenton's reaction again iron is a very important oxidative agent and it can oxidize anything and there will be a free radical injury because of fenton's reaction and that's going to result in lot of damage to the organs where it is going to get deposited so what are the sequelae of excess iron which means what is going to be the clinical features so remember the main organ that will be handling the iron is going to be the liver so liver is the first organ to be affected and one of the most important organs to be affected which can result in the development of cirrhosis and hepatocellular cancer over a period of time and it can get deposited in some endocrine organs like pancreas pituitary and all in the pancreas it will result in diabetes mellitus at the same time it can result in deposition in the skin that is called as i mean that can result in development of hyperpigmentation and uh, this as given the nomenclature called as bronze diabetes we know that and these three things is what we called as classical triad of hemochromatosis which are discussed multiple times in the past cirrhosis diabetes and hyperpigmentation of the skin so this is a classic triad even though the classic triad is seen in less than 10 to 20% of the individuals we know that but liver is the most common organ to be affected due to iron overload especially hereditary forms of hemochromatosis it can get deposited in the pituitary and gonads as well because of that it can result in hypogonadism this hypogonadism can be of any type if it's pituitary related problem then it will be a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism if it's a gonad related problem then it will be a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism then apart from that it can develop i mean can deposit in the joints iron can get deposit in the joints which can cause this typical uh, hemochromato hemochromatic arthropathy and they will ask you which is the most common joints that will be affected are the typical classic joints that will be affected in hemochromatosis that is second and third mcp joints second and third metacarpophalangeal joints are the most common joints that are affected in hemochromatosis and remember usually hemochromatosis will result in chondrocalcinosis and this chondrocalcinosis may be the reason for developing cppd as well in fact we have discussed in rheumatology itself hemochromatosis is one of the important risk factors for developing calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease that is cppd and uh, these patients also have increased risk of developing joint infections not only joint increased risk of developing certain infections as well i think in the premium sessions in hematology i have discussed this certain chelating agents itself will increase the risk of infections similarly increased iron in the body itself will increase the risk of certain infections like listeria second is asenia enterocolitic infection because this is a sideroforic organism which is an iron loving organism then we have vibrio vulnificus this also an iron requiring organism i can write vibrio vulnificus vulnificus so clear iron generally promote listerial growth asenia is also an iron loving organism and vibrio is basically iron requiring organism this vibrio vulnificus these are the three infections that are going to happen in increased incidence in patients who are having increased iron in the body especially those who are suffering from hemochromatosis but please understand the fact that hemochromatosis especially hereditary forms per se are extremely rare in india it's very common in caucasian population if you go to europe or if you go to especially northern europe uk scotland iceland greenland norway sweden including france germany and all such a common disease you you know like uh, in any patient who's coming with liver disorder especially chronic hepatitis or an acute hepatitis they do mandatory serum ferritin and that's a very important test for them but in india it's a very very rare disease even if you i mean i have not seen uh, during my post graduation days i tried to diagnose the hereditary forms of hemochromatosis but i failed really uh, i thought it's hereditary hemochromatosis but ultimately you know like it won't be hereditary hemochromatosis it will be something else that's because of excitement during that period i tend to i try to diagnose hereditary hemochromatosis but you can never find out in india i don't think so if anyone finds you can present it in a paper it's a very rare disease in india you don't find hereditary hemochromatosis really that's practicality if somebody find i mean finds hereditary hemochromatosis you cannot ask the uh, you know like pedigree analysis very properly the reason is because either some of their ancestors would be of caucasian descent or there could be an anglo indian population or probably they are bluffing anyone it's very very rare to have hereditary hemochromatosis without a caucasian background it's impossible that's something you need to know and uh, you know the pathophysiology very simply so i mean pathophysiology is quite easy so we don't want to discuss that in detail uh, let me tell you a quick pathophysiology of that you know this is a hepatocyte and they can sense the circulating iron of course 
and the most important ways of i mean sensing this ion is the transfer receptor 2 can write TFR2. The transfer receptor type 2 is the one that senses ion in the apatocyte. And once they sense ion, this will give signal to the HFE gene. And this HFE gene through a cascade, it will give stimulus to the hemojuvenilin. And further, it will give stimulus to the BMP6 receptor, that is bone morphogenic protein 6 receptor. And uh, once this BMP6 receptor is activated, they will activate a pathway called as MAD pathway. So this MAD pathway, especially SMAD4 is the typical molecule that we're going to discuss. This MAD4 is going to bind to the certain domains in the DNA and they will activate a very important gene called as HAMP gene that will be activated. Upon activation of HAMP gene, they're going to produce hepsirin, of course. And this hepsirin is considered to be a central molecule of ion regulation in the body. And this hepsirin, of course, is going to have multiple effects. The most important effect is going to be inhibition of ferroportin. Ferroportin is the portal for ion entry into the body. Uh, in the sense, like uh, two ways of free ion formation in the body. One, it absorbs the dietary ion. For absorption of dietary ion, you need ferroportin. Even though DMT2, you have studied is in the divalent metal transport. DMT is the one that is important for absorption from one side, from the luminal surface of the enterocyte. To push this ion into the other surface of the enterocyte, you need this ferroportin, which means ferroportin is important for absorption. At the same time, you have the senescent RBCs which are actually swallowed and destroyed by the reticular endothelial system like macrophages and other forms of reticular endothelial system that again through ferroportin only they are going to release ion. So and this ferroportin will be basically uh, blocked by hepsin. Hepsin is the one that's going to block this ferroportin. So in the sense like uh, ferroportin, I mean hepsin is the one that actually tries to reduce the serum ion in response to sensing of ion. So it's like a negative regulating thing. So it's a negative feedback kind of an hormone. Like epsilon can be regarded as a hormone as well. So that's how it works. And the amount of epsilon can be increased by multiple uh, ways. So one way to increase is inflammation. Inflammation increases epsilon, which means epsilon you can think it as a positive acute phase reactant as well. So that is why whenever there is an inflammation, you will have increased ferritin. At the same time, you have increased epsilon as well. And that's why anemia of chronic disease is completely different from iron deficiency anemia. In iron deficiency anemia, you have low ferritin and of course an undetectable hepsirin in iron deficiency anemia. Because in a true iron deficiency, your amount of iron will be low in the body. So that is why hepsirin levels will be undetectable. But in patients with anemia of chronic disease, because of inflammation-related anemia, you will be having high hepsirin and, and you will be having high ferritin as well because both hepsirin as well as ferritin are considered to be acute phase reactants in that perspective. Clear? So, epsilon is a positive acute phase reactant. So, that is the reason whenever you have a problem. For example, let us assume you have a problem in uh, HFE, that is HFE gene. So, if you have a problem in HFE gene, your epsilon levels will be very, very low, which means this entire sequence, I mean, cascade will be abnormal in the sense like they cannot stimulate hemojuvenilin, they cannot stimulate SMAT, they cannot stimulate HAMPA gene. So, the epsilon production will be low. So, if at all the epsilon production is low, uh, now the it's like the sensing capacity is lost. They cannot sense the serum ion anymore and they will be absorbing the ion in an unregulated fashion. So there will be unregulated ion absorption in the intestine. Because of unregulated ion absorption, uh, the serum ion will increase and the free ion in the body will increase and they will start depositing in the organs as well, causing damage. And this increased ion cannot be sensed because, I mean, HFE gene is a defect. So they'll be persistently having low epsilon and they will be uh, having unregulated ion absorption. Because of that, this is going to result in development of ion overload and resulting, subsequently results in hemochromatosis. And that is the problem here. So this is, this, I mean, pathophysiology in a nutshell. So either HFE gene defect or probably HJV gene defect or probably HAM gene defect, all these things will result in uh, epsilon deficiency. And because of epsilon deficiency, you might result in increased uh, uh, ion absorption, unregulated ion absorption, because of that you might result in development of secondary ion overload. Remember, ferroportin defects typically result in different kind of a problem in the sense like uh, uh, they cannot eliminate ion from the reticular endothelial system. In the sense like the reticular endothelial system, ion will increase. And that is why I told you in ferroportin defects, in type 4 hemochromatosis, you are basically going to have ion deposition in the reticular endothelial system, that is Kupfer cells. And that is going to damage the liver because cell activation will result in cirrhosis and subsequently 
uh, hepatic cellular cancer as well. So we have discussed that already. So type four is a little different, but uh, type one, type two, and type three are basically straightforward, which is easy to understand. So this is a pathophysiology of hereditary hemochromatosis in a nutshell. As we have discussed, let us see some of the important clinical features here. Uh, as I've told you, uh, patients can be asymptomatic in the sense like they will come with just LFT abnormalities. This is one of the most common presentation. The sense like most of the hereditary hemochromatosis patients will be coming in an asymptomatic fashion. The sense like just with an asymptomatic LFT abnormality. OTPT might be elevated. So that is one way they can present. Symptomatic presentations are quite rare. If they come with symptoms, the most common symptom is going to be fatigue. Fatigue is the most common symptom of many other disorders like even SLE also fatigue is the most common uh, symptom usually at the time of presentation. So fatigue is the most common symptom for hereditary hemochromatosis patients or any hemochromatosis as well. And this is followed by hyperpigmentation. And this is followed by arthralgia. Arthralgia is quite common, typically affecting the second and third intercostal joints. Then fourth is going to be the importance. And uh, they can develop diabetes mellitus. They can develop cardiomyopathy over a period of time. And uh, they can develop cirrhosis and hepatocellular failure as well. I mean, hepatocellular cancer as well over a period of time. So these are basically regarded as complications of hemochromatosis. And one of the important complications that you need to know is cirrhosis and hepatocellular cancer, even though they can produce cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy can be of any type. It means it can be of uh, hypertrophic type or it can be of restrictive type or it can be of dilated type also. It can produce any form of cardiomyopathy, but in exam, it's better to answer restrictive type, even though it can produce dilated type of cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic is the rarest form of cardiomyopathy. All these three types of cardiomyopathy are uh, described in literature, hypertrophic, restrictive, as well as dilated. But in exam, if you want to go, you can go for restrictive type. But in reality, uh, uh, which is, I mean, these common things are not mentioned in literature, that's why. But there are some small trials which still restrictive is more compared to dilated. But in, in no textbook really tells which is more common, restrictive or dilated. But in exam, I would answer if they ask. I don't think they will ask. But if they ask, I'll go for restrictive. Dilated is little less common. But they can produce dilated as well as restricted form of cardiomyopathy. Least common form, it's very clear it is hypertrophic form. Then coming to the investigations and diagnose. How to di uh, diagnose based on your uh, workup. So investigation-wise, you have a screening test. The first screening test or the first test to be done in patients with suspected hemochromatosis transfer and saturation. TSAT is the first test. It's going to be the most sensitive and it's going to be screening test. For all practical purposes, we often combine with serum ferritin because ferritin is not that expensive test. It's very commonly done. So whenever you do a TSAT, you also do ferritin. For all practical purposes, you are going to do TSAT and ferritin together. It's not that you're going to do only TSAT for the first time or only TSAT you're not going to perform. You're going to do along with ferritin only. So let us see an algorithm. Suppose a patient is having a suspected iron overload what you will do. The patient is having a suspect iron overload. So you are going to do TSAT and ferritin together tandemly. I'm not telling you will do only TSAT, like how we tell, told for Wilson, this is the same pattern I'm going to use. So if the TSAT is less than 45 percentage or the TSAT is more than 45 percentage. If the TSAT less than 45 percentage, it is definitely not hemochromatosis. It's not hereditary hemochromatosis for sure. You can rule out because it's considered to be extremely sensitive. Then you can see ferritin. If the ferritin is also normal, then of course it's a normal person. I mean, I'll not call normal patient, I'll call normal person because this is completely normal. So the ferritin levels are increased. In this condition, think about um, other causes of elevated ferritin. Other cause of increased ferritin, probably it might be due to some inflammation because in inflammation, the T-set levels will be low. That's something we have studied. Uh, it's a common thing with iron deficiency. Both iron deficiency anemia as well as anemia chronitis will have a low transfer and saturation, but they'll be having a high ferritin. So you have to think about other causes like inflammation. If the TSAT is more than 40 percentage, then in that setting, you can think about a likely iron overload. So now you can see serum ferritin here in this perspective. The serum ferritin levels are low or probably serum ferritin levels are normal. I'm not calling low here because low serum ferritin goes towards an iron deficiency anemia, which I'm not going to do not going to discuss about that. So serum ferritin is normal, which means here you're just going to do a close follow because these patients are prone for iron deficiency. I mean, uh, iron overload over a period of time. The serum ferritin is increased, then definitely this patient is having a iron overload for sure. 
So remember, increased transferrin saturation and increased serum ferritin will only tell that the patient is having a likely iron overload that will not tell you the cause. Then further, you need to evaluate for the cause. Evaluate for the cause. So how will you tell that the patient is having hereditary hemochromatosis? For that, the best test, if at all somebody asks you, answer will be genetic testing. Of course, it will tell you the type as well as whatever you want, you can get out of this genetic test, which means classically you'll be looking for the homozygosity of that C282Y and H63D of the HFE gene. That's what you're going to find. Or alternatively, you can do a liver biopsy as well. Liver biopsy as well. Once again, liver biopsy is not going to suggest you, you know, like hereditary hemochromatosis, because if you want to use the term hereditary hemochromatosis, you need to do a genetic testing. That's the only way. But liver biopsy can be used as an adjunctive test. Liver biopsy is considered to be the traditional gold standard. And you know what is the stain that we are going to do in liver biopsy for staining iron? So let me show you this picture. So you will be able to tell. What is the stain basically and what you're seeing here? So whatever that is shown in this blue granules, uh, whatever, you know, like this blue granules inside the hepatocyte are basically the iron deposition. So what is the stain that is used? It's a very common thing. I mean, I just want to know whether you're attending or not. What is the stain that is used? So this is pearl's Prussian blue or simply called as pearl stain. So it's called, otherwise called as pearl's Prussian blue or simply pearl stain. So that's what I'm going to use for staining iron. So that, this is a liver biopsy specimen that is stained with pearl's Prussian blue. And you can see this iron granules in the liver biopsy. Clear? And there is a lot of grading, which is uh, not uh, good to discuss right now, which is beyond the scope of the current discussion. And uh, when you do liver biopsy, liver biopsy is not mandatory for diagnosis, but it is important for, I mean, uh, prognostication as well. So to see the extent of liver damage. So for that, you need liver biopsy. It's not only for diagnosis. Diagnosis, you need genetic testing. But to see the extent of liver damage, you need liver biopsy as well. So when will you do? What are the main indications for doing liver biopsy? Number one, elevated liver enzymes. ALT, AST elevated. Second, uh, serum ferritin, more than 1,000. Serum ferritin, more than 1,000. These patients are highly prone for developing cirrhosis and hepatocellular cancer over a period of time. And that is the reason why liver biopsy is indicated here. Remember, liver biopsy, more than uh, diagno I mean, more than it is used for diagnostic purpose, it will be more used for prognostication. In the sense like to see the extent of liver damage, amount of cirrhosis or hidden cirrhosis in the liver, you need a liver biopsy in this setting. Because when our ferritin is more than 1,000, and if AST, ALT are elevated, it means definitely there is ongoing damage and the can patient can have cirrhosis. You don't know. So that is the reason why you need a liver biopsy. Liver biopsy is more prognostic in this particular situation. So this is the most important uh, thing to know. And apart from that, you can do MRI. MRI is one of the non-invasive methods of quantifying iron. Um, if they ask you the best non-invasive ways, the best non-invasive ways to quantify iron or liver iron or uh, the best non-invasive test to quantify hepatic iron, MRI is going to be the gold standard. Uh, one more advantage of MRI is the fact it can actually assess cardiac as well as hepatic iron. It is not going to only assess the liver iron. It's also going to assess the cardiac iron as well. So both cardiac iron overload as well as liver iron overload can be diagnosed with MRI testing. And based on liver biopsy, you can tell the severity depending on amount of iron. So you can divide into mild, moderate, and severe. So mild in the range of 70 to 98 microgram per gram of dry weight or micromole per gram of dry weight and moderate in the range of 99 to 200 micromole per gram of dry weight and severe means more than 200 micromoles per gram of dry weight. Uh, whenever hepatic iron concentration is more than 80, you can think about uh, iron overload. Normal hepatic iron will be somewhere on less than 40 or less than 35. That will be normal hepatic iron. But if it's more than 70 or more than 80, definitely you can think about iron overload. Mild means 198, moderate means 99 to 200. Severe means it's going to be more than 200. Based on certain algorithms, you can even class, I mean, tell how much, uh, I mean, hepatic iron is there in this particular patient. Then coming to the treatment of iron overload, as well as treatment of iron overload, I mean, treatment of hereditary hemochromatosis is concerned. 
I mean, remember, first of all, you need to know how you treat the HHC as well as secondary iron overload. So patients who are asymptomatic, plus if they're having serum ferritin less than 500, you just need an annual follow. That's all. Just annual follow-up is enough. If the patient is asymptomatic and having a serum ferritin of less than 500. Suppose the patient is symptomatic. That's all. Or having a serum ferritin of more than 500, then definitely you need to treat this patient and the treatment of choice is phlebotomy. Phlebotomy is the best treatment for this patient. Chelation is not a very good option. Phlebotomy is the best option. Plus at the same time, you need to give a complete, you know, like dietary advice. So to reduce the dietary iron intake. This is very, very important because I told you in the problem in uh, any form of hereditary hemochromatosis, the excessive absorption of iron from the intestine because of low hepcidin. So they cannot, they are, cannot afford to take any, any, I mean, substance which has increased iron. So you should always tell a strict dietary advice to reduce the intake of dietary iron. Uh, suppose if the patient is not tolerating phlebotomy or the phlebotomy is contraindicated, then second line option will be chelating agents. Chelators. You know, there are many different types of chelators that right from defroxamine to defrosirox. We have different types of iron chelators are there. But uh, typically only if the phlebotomy is contraindicated or the phlebotomy is intolerable, then in that setting, you can go for chelators. But apart from that, phlebotomy is going to be the standard therapy of choice. Uh, can you tell what is the contraindication of phlebotomy? Can anyone tell what is going to be the contraindication of phlebotomy? Contraindication of phlebotomy. So what makes phlebotomy as a, a contraindication? What makes phlebotomy a contraindication? Where you should not do a phlebotomy or where you cannot do a phlebotomy? Uh, not really cellulitis. The most important contraindication is going to be the anemia. Anemia is a very important contraindication for doing a phlebotomy. Already the patient is anemic. How can you remove blood? You can't. So that's why anemia is a contraindication. So whenever anemia is there, in that setting, you can go for chelating agents. But if the patient is not having anemia, then any iron overload, phlebotomy is the best option. So patients are having, that is the reason why patients are having thalassemia. You don't really give phlebotomy. The reason why you don't give phlebotomy in thalassemia patients is because they're already anemic, severely anemic. You can't do phlebotomy there. In that setting, for transplant-related uh, iron overload state, I mean, chelating agents are the best choice. So, but remember, secondary means in exam, usually you encounter this thalassemia or probably myelodysplastic syndrome. So where you're going to use chelators as a first choice. Phlebotomy is contraindicated here because the patient is thalassemic and they will have severe anemia. And you cannot give... Uh, I mean, phlebotomy and chelators are the best choice in this particular patient. Clear? Uh, so then you can see the resolution markers as well. So uh, what is the amount of phlebotomy you should do in all these things beyond the scope, but still let me tell you how much of phlebotomy should be done. Uh, current, I mean, typically we do initially, not later. Initially we remove one to two sittings, one to two sittings per week of phlebotomy. Each sitting will remove approximately 500 ml of blood. 500 ml of blood will be removed per session in each sitting. So typically in the early stages, we'll do one to two sittings per week. But later on, depending on serum ferritin levels, you can adjust your number of phlebotomies over a period of time. But initially, whenever the serum ferritin is very high, like more than 1000, that will be the usual case in the setting of hereditary hemochromatosis. In that setting, probably you can try one to two sittings per week. Each sitting will remove 500 ml of blood approximately. So you are going to do this till you reach a particular target. What is the target? Of course, the serum ferritin is going to serve as a target as well. It should be in the range of 50 to 100, which is a normal serum ferritin, 50 to 100 nanograms per deciliter. So if you reach this uh, 50 to 100 nanograms uh, per deciliter range of serum ferritin, normal is somewhere around 10 to 200. So if you reach this 50 to 100, so that's a normal ferritin and that's going to be the target, clear? So once you have achieved this target, then you can go for maintenance phlebotomy. Maintenance phlebotomy. So maintenance phlebotomy, just one sitting every probably three months. 
So typically every two to four months. So, but in general, we advise the patient to come for phlebotomy every three months. So this is the usual maintenance dose of phlebotomy. So initially you start with one to two sittings per week till you reach a target serum ferritin of 50 to 100. After that, you can go for maintenance phlebotomy. That is one sitting every three months or ideally two to four months. That's the ideal thing. So what is the, you know, like uh, outcomes? So once you do phlebotomy and you remove iron periodically, what are going to the outcomes? Outcomes, which means there is something called resolution of certain symptoms. And there are certain symptoms which will not resolve. No resolution. And this is something which will be asked in exam. So even if you do a phlebotomy in a patient with hemochromatosis, what are the symptoms that do not resolve? Which means what are things that are irreversible? That's what I'm asking. One is hypogonadism. Very, very important. Hypogonadism is something that cannot be reversed with any kind of treatment in hereditary hemochromatosis. And second is arthropathy. These are the two things that are routinely asked in many entrance exams. Around the world, everywhere they will ask, especially go for USMLE or even PLAB exams. This is something that's one of the 100% questions. What are the things that will not resolve with phlebotomy, hypogonadism and arthropathy? Probably you can think about cirrhosis and HCC. Remember, this is something that is already known. Once the patient goes to cirrhosis, you cannot reverse. It's an irreversible stage. We know that. So that is something not going to be an exam question. So the exam question is going to be on hypogonadism and arthropathy, which cannot be reversed even if you do phlebotomy or any other modality of iron uh, chelating, I mean, iron removal state. Resolution will happen in cardiac function. Cardiomyopathy is something that responds excellently with phlebotomy and uh, removal of iron from the body. So cardiomyopathy is very, very important, which responds to iron removal and phlebotomy. And second is fatigue, which is one of the very common symptoms, as I told you, that will resolve over a period of time. And diabetes is something that can improve and skin hyperpigmentation also improves to a great value. Skin hyperpigmentation. And subjectively, hepatomegaly, which is commonly seen in many hemochromatosis patients, might improve over a period of time. Remember, if the patient has gone for cirrhosis, then it may not improve. But if the patient is not having cirrhosis, but having only hepatomegaly, it might improve over a period of time. But the most important point here is the fact that cardiomyopathy and diabetes will resolve with treatment uh, by phlebotomy. So with treatment, cardiomyopathy and diabetes will resolve, but hypo, hypogonadism and arthropathy will not resolve usually. So contraindication of phlebotomy, as I told you, the most important contraindication is going to be anemia. Second is, of course, poor vascular access. This is not common nowadays. If you don't have vascular access, you cannot remove the blood. So very simple contraindication. Anemia is the most important and the most important uh, clinical contraindication, if you see, most clinically relevant contraindication. And next is heart failure. Because heart failure patients will not tolerate to removal of iron, I mean, removal of blood and anemia subsequently. So heart failure, anemia, and poor vascular access, three contraindications, but anemia is going to be the most important contraindication of all. Fine. So this is all about hereditary hemochromatosis. So what all we have discussed in hereditary, I mean, hemochromatosis, we have discussed the difference between primary and uh, secondary forms of hemochromatosis and the four gene defects we have discussed already. And uh, what are the complications due to hemochromatosis? And uh, what is the pathophysiology? Uh, the first three types are due to low hepsirin, directly or indirectly, like probably HFE, HJV, or uh, ampigene mutations. Fourth one is a little different autosomal dominant due to ferropotent defect. And that will result in poor release of iron from reticular reticulum system. So that will be a little different accumulation of iron in the RES and especially Kupfer cells in the liver. All other three types will have increased iron accumulation in the uh, hepatocyte parenchyma. And uh, clinical feature wise, uh, most of them will present asymptomatically with incident, I mean, incidental LFT abnormality. Few can be symptomatic. Most common is fatigue. And we have seen a variety of other symptoms. How to diagnose the first and the screening test is TSAT, usually done along with ferritin. And if you have high ferritin, high TSAT, it's iron overload, but you need to find out the cause. The best is genetic testing for that. And liver biopsy, more than diagnosing, it's used for prognostication, especially to see the amount of damage done by the excess iron. Indications are serum ferritin more than 1000 plus increased AST or ALT. MRI is the best non invasive test which can assess both liver and hepatic iron both. The stain used for staining iron in the liver is pulse pressure and blue. And treatment wise, a secondary iron overload, best choice is chelators because most of them will be due to anemia and transfer-related iron overload. And for primary hereditary forms of hemochromatosis, uh, asymptomatic and serum fit less than 500, no treatment. Symptomatic patients need treatment. The best treatment is phlebotomy. And three contraindications you need to know. Most important is anemia, then heart failure and poor vascular access. Usually done at one to two sittings per week, removing 500 ml of blood per sitting till you reach the target ferritin of 50 to 100. After that, you go for maintenance phlebotomy, which is going to be approximately 
uh, one sitting in every three months, ideally two to four months. Outcome wise, hypogonadism and arthropathy will not resolve with phlebotomy, whereas cardiomyopathy and diabetes will resolve with phlebotomy. Do you understand this? So we can move on to the next one. That is alpha antrypsin deficiency. Cool. We have alpha one and antrypsin deficiency. Alpha and antrypsin deficiency. As far as alpha and antrypsin deficiency are concerned, uh, typically, you know, like this is a disease that is co-dominant inheritance followed by autosomal recessive. But remember, in exam, this is something which is very important. So this is not autosomal dominant or not autosomal recessive. Uh, it is autosomal co-dominant. It's a co-dominant inheritance, kind of pattern of inheritance. And the gene defect, defective gene, you know, the defective gene is something called a Serpina 1. It's a protease, Serpina 1, which is present in chromosome number 14. You can remember, Wilson disease and alpha antrypsin deficiency are next to each other. In the sense, Wilson disease is chromosome number 13 and alpha antrypsin is chromosome number 14. Both are metabolic liver disease and next door neighbors, 13 and 14. So Serpina 1 is present in chromosome number 14 and that is the defect here. And remember, synthesis of alpha trypsin 1, I mean alpha antrypsin synthesis, they ask you where it happens, it happens in the liver. Liver is the place where you have alpha antrypsin synthesis going on. But it's going to affect the lung. So that is the irony here. But nevertheless, uh, you have a lot of allelic variations are there. But whenever you have an alpha antrypsin deficiency, it can affect two organs. The most common organ affect is the lung. Lung is the most common organ that is affected in reality. Liver is not the common organ. Liver sometimes can be affected, sometimes may not be affected. So what is the reason for uh, lung? The reason for lung problem. Lung means you are going to develop emphysema over a period of time. Emphysema. And the type of emphysema you develop with uh, alpha antrypsin deficiency is panacena type of emphysema, not central lobular type, which is seen in smoking patients. And uh, typically it's going to affect the lower lobes. Whereas smoking related emphysema will be central lobular and will be affecting predominantly the upper lobes. But uh, emphysema due to alpha antrypsin deficiency will be affecting the lower lobes and will be of panacena type. Entire SNA will be affected. And uh, the reason, the pathophysiology behind emphysema in patients with alpha antrypsin deficiency is the actual deficiency. Actual deficiency of alpha antitrypsin uh, is going to cause emphysema here. So you always have a balance between protease and antiproteases. Both have to be in balance. Right? One of the important antiproteases is alpha antitrypsin. Suppose if alpha antitrypsin levels are low, what happens? Your protease levels will be very high and antiprotease levels will be very low. So this too much of protease, especially proteases typically come from neutrophils. Neutrophils. So this might this proteases might uh, damage the elastin, which can subsequently result in hyperinflation and emphysema. So that is the idea here. So the problem here is very simple. It's the actual deficiency of alpha and trypsin that is going to cause emphysema, lung damage. But liver damage is quite different. You know, like liver damage is not due to alpha and trypsin deficiency. Here, I mean, the reason here, they might develop anything. They might develop uh, chronic liver disease. They might develop cirrhosis over a period of time, which might further result in HCC. HCC is quite rare in alpha and trypsin, but nevertheless, it can result theoretically speaking. So cirrhosis and CLD are real time threats. But remember, the pathophysiology of developing hepatitis and liver problems in patients with alpha and antrypsin is not the actual deficiency. It is actually the impaired secretion. Impaired secretion of alpha and antitrypsin by the hepatocytes. If they do not secrete alpha, which means here, the alpha and antitrypsin is produced normally. To get a liver damage, to get a liver damage, first of all, you need to produce alpha and antitrypsin properly. And the problem should be impaired secretion. So if the patient is having impaired secretion, but an okay production, then in that setting, you might result in accumulation of this alpha antrypsin within the hepatocyte, which may damage the hepatocyte, resulting in development of cirrhosis and uh, liver disease over a period of time. So that is why you need to know about the allelic variations. So first of all, let us talk about uh, something called as an M allele. So let us see the allele and uh, what will happen to the plasma level if you have that particular allele and whether you will have a lung disease or whether you have a liver disease or not. That's what we're going to see. 
the first allelic type is the M type, which is a normal allele. M is supposed to be the normal allele, uh, which means the plasma levels are going to be normal with if you have a M allele. Lung disease is definitely no liver disease, no, because it's a normal allele. And then you have a Z allele. Z allele is a defective allele, which means uh, Z is the one that is going to produce the intracellular accumulation. Intracellular accumulation of uh, alpha antitrypsin within the hepatocyte. In the sense, Z is typically going to result in okay production, but poor secretion of alpha antitrypsin. So it will accumulate within the liver. Uh, so in the sense like uh, the plasma levels will be reduced because they cannot secrete this alpha antitrypsin properly. And lung disease definitely yes. And liver disease definitely yes. There's no doubt about that. If you have a Z1. Then there is something called as a yes phenotype. If you have a yes phenotype, there will be intracellular degradation of alpha antitrypsin in the sense like they are produced properly. They can be secreted, not a problem, but due to unknown reasons, the secreted alpha antitrypsin is going to be degraded within the hepatocyte. Probably defective alpha antitrypsin, that's why they are degraded within the hepatocyte. In this setting, the plasma levels will be reduced for sure. And liver, I mean, lung disease will be there here because there will be deficiency, but there won't be any liver disease, of course, because there is no accumulation, it's only degradation. Then you have something called a null phenotype. It's called null phenotype, which means there will be absolutely no synthesis of alpha antitrypsin. Here, the typically speaking, there will be no alpha antitrypsin in the blood at all. And because of no alpha antitrypsin, because of deficiency, there will be lung disease here, but there won't be liver disease because there's no synthesis. So only accumulation will cause uh, problems. If there's no synthesis, you cannot get liver disease here. So there's no liver disease again here. There is another form. This is a completely different one. There is a F form is there. So this is due to impact binding with neutrophil elastase. Impact binding with proteases. Remember, antiproteases should bind with proteases to neutralize them. So if they do not bind properly, once again, it's a functional defect. That's why it's called a F. It's a functional defect. It's not a qualitative defect. It's not a quantitative defect. It's a qualitative defect. They cannot bind with the neutrophil elastase, which means they cannot bind with the antiprotease. Because of that, the levels may be normal but they will be having lung disease, but they won't have liver disease because again, here the secretion is normal. The problem is a functional defect. So if you see, there is only one allelic type that is going to result in liver disease. And that is the Z phenotype. So only Z phenotype will produce liver disease. Almost everything will produce lung disease. Every single phenotype will produce lung disease, but only Z allele or that Z phenotype is the one that is going to produce uh, liver disease. So that is something which has to be known and that's multiple times asked question in the exam. And as far as the lung disease is concerned, you will result in a moderate kind of emphysema in Z phenotype, very, very mild disease in the setting of uh, S phenotype and very severe disease in the uh, setting of uh, null phenotype, which means there is absolutely no alpha antitrypsin. So it will result in a very severe emphysema at a very early age. And here the severity is variable which means the most severest form of emphysema will happen in null phenotype only. And the liver disease will happen only in Z phenotype. These are the two take home points. Severest form of emphysema in null phenotype or a null allele. And in a liver disease will happen only in Z allele or Z phenotype. Remember, this is really, really important. Based on that, they will give some combinations, some genotypes as well. Based on this, they will be giving some combination and genotypes as well. So what are the combinations that you need to know? The first combination is called as PAMM. So PA stands for Pittsburgh here. So based on that, I mean, that's the terminology given. PAMM is there. So you know, M, M means both stands for normal. So we can put alpha antitrypsin levels in the plasma considered to be normal. Normal range is somewhere around 150 to 350 milligrams per deciliter. Clear? And uh, intracellular accumulation will be there or not? Let us see. Intracellular accumulation will be there or not? So thereby liver disease will be there or not. Lung disease will be there or not. Intracellular accumulation, definitely no. Liver disease, no. Lung disease, no, because it's a normal phenotype, normal genotype. So then we have PIMS is there. So here one is normal. I mean, because both are, I mean, one is got, I mean, why I'm telling two is because uh, each allele is inherited from one particular parent. Father will give one, mother will give one. If both gives normal alleles, then absolutely normal person. If one is abnormal, one is of S type. So in that setting, it will be near normal because one is completely normal. One is 
uh, of mild problem only because here the intracellular accumulation again is not happening because the problem with the S uh, allele, I told you it's intracellular degradation, not intracellular accumulation. So of course you're not going to get liver disease and lung disease also is not a problem. Why? Because one allele is normal and that is enough to take care and it will be a near normal alpha antitrypsin. So it will be of a silent type. So it can be deemed as a carrier to be honest. And of course, there's something called PASCS is there. Again, these are called as carriers because there'll be mild decline in alpha antitrypsin. In the sense, it will be in the range of 100 to 200 basically. Uh, intracellular accumulation, once again, no. Lung disease and liver disease usually will not happen. And now once again, these patients will act as carriers. And next we have something called PAMZ is there. So once again, there will be a mild decline. Once again, the range will be in the 100 to 200. Uh, the problem with MZ is the fact that they are having a Z phenotype here. So there will be some intracellular accumulation and there will be a liver disease, which will be of very, very mild type. Uh, usually lung disease possible, theoretically speaking, but in general, it is no. In general, they won't develop lung disease because the levels are very, very low. I mean, very, I mean, very, I mean, very near normal range, very mild decline, decline in the alpha nitrogen levels in the blood will be there. So possible lung disease, but in general, they won't get. But liver disease definitely yes, but it'll be very mild. Only elevation of transaminase will be there. And next phenotype is something called PASZ. Here, moderate decline will be there, usually in the range of 45 to 80. That's the range. Uh, intracellular accumulation, definitely yes. And liver disease, yes, but it'll be usually mild. Lung disease, surely yes, but it'll be mild. And next we have something called PAZZ. ZZ, there will be a severe decline in alpha antitrypsin, usually in the range of 10 to 40 in general. Intracellular accumulation, yes, that is because of Z phenotype here. Both are Z, so definitely there will be intracellular accumulation. And liver disease, yes, very severe form of liver disease, and these patients are prone for developing cirrhosis as well. And there will be yes, and the disease will be usually severe in this setting. And next phenotype is PA null phenotype. Both are null. In this setting, there will be undetectable alpha antitrypsin levels, usually less than 10 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, there will be no intracellular accumulation, which means there will be no liver disease, but there will be lung disease for sure. And it's the most severest form. Usually the most severest form is this null phenotype as far as the lung disease is concerned. The most severest form as far as liver disease is concerned is the ZZ phenotype. ZZ phenotype will produce the most severe form of liver disease and null phenotype will produce the most severe form of lung disease, which you have discussed already. And like this, we can write multiple genotypes, but these are the usual described phenotypes in Caucasian population. And that is something which is important to know. But the final take home point is whenever you have this Z allele, you will have liver disease. Whenever you have null, you have the severest form of lung disease. And almost every allele can produce lung disease. But apart from that, this S, uh, you know, like this SZ, ZZ, and null phenotype is the one that's going to typical result in development of lung disease to a detectable range. And how will you know whether the patient is having alpha antitrypsin related emphysema or not? So whenever the patient is having a panacinar type of emphysema, you can think about alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Whenever the patient is having emphysema in age of less than 45 years, very young emphysema, think about alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Third, whenever emphysema happens in a non-smoker at an early age, think about alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Whenever patient is having emphysema, along with that, the patient is having uh, LFT abnormalities, which means lung and liver disease together, especially panacinar emphysema with the liver disease together, ALT, 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 elevated, then in that setting, you can think about, uh, I mean, alpha antitrypsin deficiency as a probable diagnosis. And if the patient is having predominant lower lobe emphysema, the lower lobe involvement, think about alpha antitrypsin deficiency. And uh, if the patient is having other associated problems, alpha antitrypsin deficiency has some associations with each other, uh, one of the important uh, association is going to be vaginous granulomatosis, especially uncastrated vasculitis. Uncastrated vasculitis. This is something very important. This is something asked in previous exams as well. So you know why uncastrated vasculitis will happen? Because anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies is the key here. So remember, the neutrophilic cytoplasm will contain some proteases, especially neutrophil elastase is there. The problem is like this proteases should neutralize this cytoplasmic enzyme that is elastase. If you don't have sufficient amount of anti-proteases that is alpha antitrypsin, there will be too much of proteases, too much of neutrophil elastases. 
and they can develop antibodies against them. So that is the reason why you might result in angiocytic vasculitis like vaginous granulomatosis also, which is possible, which could be a question, probable question in your exam. And they can develop bronchiectasis because of emphysema over a period of time. And they can develop necrotizing paniculitis. Paniculitis means fat inflammation, especially in the thighs and the buttocks. They can develop necrotizing paniculitis. These are the usual uh, clues towards the diagnosis of alpha antrypsin deficiency. The patient is uh, having emphysema plus any one of this, like panacea type, lower lobe involvement, acidity left ear mounting, non-smoker, age less than 45, and uh, these kind of oscillations. If they have any of this, you can think about alpha antrypsin deficiency in exam. So investigation wise, the best test, of course, they ask you is the genetic testing, which is the best test. You can uh, do a genotyping and that's going to be the best test basically, genetic testing. And that's the most accurate test as well. And you can do serum protein electrophoresis, which can diagnose to an extent, but it's not specific or sensitive. So normally in a serum protein electrophoresis, you know what are the spikes you're going to see. You'll be seeing something like this. Uh, this is a normal serum protein electrophoresis. The bigger spike is, of course, the albumin. And after that, we have globulins. The final one, we have the gamma globulins. Then we have beta globulin. Then we have alpha-1 globulin. Then we have alpha-2 globulin. In patients with alpha-1 antrypsin, especially if they have significant deficiency, they'll be having a small spike. Maybe a flattening of the spike like this. Apart from that, everything will be normal. Albumin, gamma globulin, beta globulin, alpha-2 globulin, all these things will be normal. Only this alpha-1 globulin spike will be little reduced. So that is suggestive of probable alpha and antrypsin deficiency if you have upper operative clinical background. But the best test is always uh, liver bio, I mean, uh, gen genotypic testing only or genetic testing. So we can do liver biopsy. Uh, liver biopsy is going to tell you the diagnosis only in Z phenotype. You know, like in other cases, it's very difficult to find out through liver biopsy. But in patients who are having Z phenotype, PAMZ or PASZ or PAZZ, so probably in this patients are having Z phenotype. You can have you can see this intracellular accumulation of this alpha antrypsin. This intracellular accumulation of alpha antrypsin will be viewed as past positive, but diastase resistant granules. Diastase resistant granules in the cytoplasm of the hepatocytes. But remember, this is valuable only if the patient is having Z phenotype. If the patient is not having Z phenotype, then this will not be that valuable to be honest. So pass positive diastase resistant granules inside the liver uh, in a patient who's having Z phenotype, probably you can clinch the diagnosis of alpha antrypsin deficiency. I mean, of Z phenotype. So other phenotypes, it's not reliable, but in patients who are having Z allele, so this will be there, that pass positive diastase resistant granules. Let me show you an image so that you understand this better. I think this is an example here. I think this is of high memory. So that's why, you know, like it's the large size file. That's why it's taking a little bit of time. It's not getting inserted, right? Yeah, got it. So these are the granules we are talking about. So these are the intracellular globules. These are pass positive. The stain that you're seeing here is pass. So pass positive, but diastase resistant globules inside the hepatocytes. Uh, I mean, you can get this in your exam as well. And this is an example of a fibrosis of the liver, so which I've shared it here. So that's a bridging fibrosis that you're seeing here. So which also tells that the patient is going for cirrhosis as well. And apart from that, uh, therapy-wise, treatment of alpha antrypsin deficiency. So you're going to have supportive management only, like for lung and liver disease. For example, for COPD, you're going to give the same supportive management and these patients should never smoke. Smoking is absolutely contraindicated. So already they, without smoking, they will develop emphysema. If they smoke, they're going to develop very accelerated emphysema. So they should never smoke and they should stop smoking if they are already smoking. And you can try alpha antrypsin replacement. 
which is commercially available but uh, not very effective so indication if the patient is having very low levels levels less than 57 mg per deciliter plus if the patient is having severe emphysema not improving with medical management severe emphysema not responding to protein therapy supportive management so in this setting probably you can think about uh, alpha nitrosine replacement it's very costly not that effective as well that is why uh, you know like usage should be more judicial and um, pertain to a particular patient so in that setting you can think about levels that are less than 57 plus the patient is having severe emphysema not responding to medical management then in that setting you can go for replacement therapy with alpha nitrosine enzyme and that will be a little effective so that can improve the survival to some extent clear but remember giving alpha nitrotrypsin again will have effect only on liver i mean lung disease but it has no effect on liver disease because lung disease only will improve to an extent by replacing the alpha nitrotrypsin but liver disease basically we know it's due to intracellular accumulation of this alpha nitrotrypsin which has literally no treatment apart from genetic therapy if it comes in the future but you need to know that alpha nitrotrypsin will not have any effect on liver disease but it can improve outcomes of lung disease to some small extent so this is something which you need to know apart from that this is a third metabolic liver disease which we have discussed which is very easy let us uh, recap alpha nitrotrypsin deficiency codominant followed by autosomal recessive serpina 1 gene defect cousin to wilson disease that is chromosome number 14 remember pathology of lung disease actual deficiency but pathophysiology of liver disease is actually intracellular accumulation which is seen only in z phenotype so null phenotype produces the most severe form of emphysema z phenotype produces the uh liver disease usually and we have different genotypes remember z liver disease null severe emphysema that's all these are two things you need to know when you have emphysema plus panasonar panasonar type or younger patient who is a non smoker with lft abnormality having low level emphysema you can think about um alpha nitrotrypsin deficiency related emphysema for that matters and at the same time when the patient is having ankylosed vas i mean if, if this might this question might be coming in exam like when the patient is having uh, alpha nitrotrypsin deficiency they are prone for developing vaginal granulomatas or any other ankylosed vasculitis as well and uh, the best test is always genetic testing serum protein electrophoresis might show reduced alpha n peak if at all the patient is having significant deficiency otherwise you will not pick up liver biopsy will show increase accumulation of alpha nitrotrypsin in the form of past positive dash test testing globules if the patient is of z phenotype treatment is supportive alpha nitrotrypsin replacement can be tried if the patient is having severe deficiency with severe emphysema not responding to medical management but remember it has no impact on liver disease it, it can improve lung disease to some small extent so this is the final take home point with regards to alpha nitrotrypsin deficiency i think you understand this with this we'll take a break maybe i will start the class at 11 pm if at all you want we'll be discussing on the liver tumors and hepatocellular cancer today so maybe i'll start the class in 11 pm thank you